Warm welcome, please, for Mark Langhorst. Welcome, Mark. Yes, thank you, Steve. Yeah, somehow this started with the father of Archimate, and then it became the godfather and then the grandfather. I don't know what that is, but it goes from bad to worse, I think. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. In the program, you might not have seen the exact title I have on screen right now, because we were not allowed to mention Archimate 3.1 until a few weeks ago. Um, but now that the release is uh, official, you can see this is about Archimate 3.1. My presentation will not be uh, uh, about the details of the changes in the, in the new version. Uh, tomorrow in the Archimate user group, I will be speaking more about that. But I will demonstrate the use of one particular addition to the language, the value stream concept, but you will see that in my presentation. Um, but the main body of the presentation is about the use of Archimate for business architecture, uh, which is one of the reasons we did put out this new version 3.1. Uh, it was also the reason already behind 3.0, adding concepts for business architecture. Um, but it's mostly about the practical use of the language uh, for that purpose. <coughs> Right, um, well, I think Steve already introduced me, so this is me. If you want to send me an email or call me, you can find me there. Um, about biz design, um, click, click. Yeah, so biz design software company. Uh, and we provide a platform that helps organizations uh, design and change their business. Uh, enterprise architecture is a big part of that, and I think we have a lot of architects in the room. Uh, other kinds of models uh, we do as well. Um, then the one slide we're most proud of, that's this one, Gartner's Magic Quadrants that recently came out. Uh, we are way up there. Um, so that's for the uh, commercial break into the content of the presentation itself. Yeah. So um, let's start with a bit of motivation for business architecture. Why do we want to have this? Why is this important? Um, actually, if you look at enterprise architecture, it should already do business architecture, right? If you look at the scope of that, business architecture should be a, a, a big part of that. But if you look at how enterprise architecture is done in practice, often you see that it is still rather IT focused. Uh, it's rather enterprise IT architecture, and the business comes kind of second. It's, it's the parts of uh, um, the organization that influence IT that many architects find most important. Um, and you even see that uh, in TOGAF. It's, I think TOGAF 9.2 is already better than 9.1, uh, but you see that it is centered around IT development. But what's the business of the business? How do you design that? That's where business architecture comes in as a kind of a, an adjacent discipline to enterprise architecture. It has some overlaps, um, but depending on where you, where you stand, it's uh, an addition or it's a part of uh, enterprise architecture that discusses how the business operates independent from the details of the implementation. So it's really about what the business does. And you really need this to translate your business strategy into action. You need this line of sight from where do we want to go and how are we going to do that. Uh, what I also see is a shift in focus in the enterprise architecture discipline. Um, Partially because IT architecture is more and more something that's done for you as an enterprise architect. Um, commercial of the shelf software has its own architecture. You don't influence that. Um, agile teams do the software architecture part. You're not in charge of that as an enterprise or a solution architect often. Um, infrastructure increasingly runs in the cloud. You don't own that. Well, if you do an EaaS platform stuff, you still need to, to do some work there, but things are moving. So I see EA shifting on the one hand towards business architecture, sort of up in the stack, and on the other hand, towards integration. Well, this presentation is not really that much about integration, but I think that's the other bit that is increasingly important for architects, integrating stuff. Um, you no longer design all your own software, but you have to integrate everything. But today is more about business architecture. Um, and then you get the discussion, uh, how do we implement our strategy? How do my business and IT solutions support that? Uh, how can I improve my capabilities uh, to uh, be prepared for the future? Uh, what do my customers need? So all sorts of reasons why you have to have this business focus on your architecture. So then into the Archimate language and where we stand today and what it can do for supporting you uh, in, with business architecture. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
Archimate, the language. I, I mocked up the, uh, the cover of the, the standard, by the way. I don't know if it really looks like, that way, but I just changed the, the number. Uh, I haven't seen the, the physical copy yet. Andrew, do you know? Is th does it look like this? Because all the others did look like this. No, it's completely different. It's ah. got the audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I need a new picture then. Um, so, what, what does Archimate offer? What is it? Well, it's a language. It's a way of expressing architectures. It's like ma natural language. It's, you, know, you, you talk Archimate. Well, sometimes I joke that uh, a colleague of mine, Hank Jonkers, and I are the only native speakers of Archimate because we are the only two left from the original uh, projects that are still working on the language. Um, but it is a language. And it has a framework to organize the concept of the language. Uh, so the Archimate framework is just there to, to organize that. Uh, it has its own graphical notation, but it's also important to create your own visualizations of models for different stakeholder groups. We will see more about that uh, when we discuss actual examples. But of course, we need a standard way of describing it for, let's say, our peers, the, the other architects. Other stakeholder groups might need uh, different visualizations there, but that's what Archimate also talks about. You can't, you can't standardize all these different visualizations, but the standard does discuss this notion of having views and viewpoints and how you could create those uh, based on the same underlying models. And it's, of course, an open standard maintained by the open group. So how do we position Archimate? And first, let's position business architecture. And here I've, I've drawn some sort of range from design and implementation really at the bottom. Um, does it point? No. Back there. Um, so we, we've got this range of, of design and implementation uh, uh, at the bottom to high-level strategy at the top. Solution architecture sits, let's say, above design and implementation. On top of that is enterprise architecture. And then at the, at the very top, we have the strategic direction of the enterprise. And you have all kinds of models in this, in this world. At the top, you talk about financial models and risk models and maybe your business model expressed in, say, a business model canvas or balanced scorecards, SWOT analyses, et cetera. And at the bottom, you have all these implementation-oriented models, say UML for software or BPMN for your processes. Now, Archimate as uh, a language covers parts of that. But first, let's position business architecture in here, if it wants to zap. Yeah, there we are. So like I said, it is, you could say, part of enterprise architecture. It's somewhat on top of enterprise architecture. It's partially into this strategy domain. So I've I don't know what it's doing, but it's somehow it gets stuck. Now we have business architecture. Archimate covers that and more, somewhat towards solution architecture, somewhat into the strategy domain. You cannot really draw a, a fixed boundary. Of course, whether something is still enterprise architecture or solution architecture is somewhat arbitrary. Whether something is business architecture or strategy is somewhat arbitrary. So Archimate covers that, that middle, uh, middle ground, uh, helps you bridge between that high level strategy uh, and the lower level solution and uh, implementation. Now, let's discuss some of the concepts for business architecture. Um, there are lots of concepts in Archimate, but not all are equally relevant. So I want to highlight a few concepts that are particularly useful and important in modeling your business architecture. Um, and then I would specifically think of the motivation elements in Archimate, and some of them, not all of them, but some of them, and I'll show more of that later. So the reasons behind your architecture. Why do you want to have it like this? Why do you want to go in that direction? Uh, what's the, uh, the need of the stakeholders? What are the drivers of the, the enterprise? Uh, where do you want to take it? The strategy elements, those were added in Archimate version 3. And those of you who know Archimate will probably use the so-called capability concept. Uh, but there are a few others. Then we have the implementation and migration elements that tell you how to get from A to B. So how do you plan your changes? What's, what's the work that's needed to implement them? Um, and of course, you also have all these core elements that sit in between, let's say, the strategy and the implementation and migration, all the central parts of the, the architecture. That's, well, you could say, traditional enterprise architecture, the, the core bits of it, which is actually the oldest part of the Archimate language. I don't want to go into that too much. 
today. Uh, I want to focus on these, these other elements. But of course, if you do a full stack of, uh, of, of architecture from strategy to, to implementation, you will need these core elements as well. We will see some of them. But I want to focus on these, uh, these other bits. So first, which, which of the motivation elements would be most relevant um, for modeling uh, your business architecture? And these are not all of them. But I would say these are the, the, the highlights. These are the, the things that you really need as a business architect. Of course, starting with your stakeholders. Who are you doing this for? Who are your customers? Who are the internal stakeholders? Your management, your employees, uh, maybe uh, external parties like regulators. Very important. Anybody who has an interest in the effects of your architecture uh, can, be a, can be a stakeholder. Then we have what motivates uh, change in the organization, the drivers behind change, and that can be the concerns of your stakeholders. Uh, there might also be other drivers uh, that are more generic, say the economic situation or new regulation. It's not always tied to one specific stakeholder, uh, but drivers are very important. Now a driver in itself doesn't say anything about whether you're doing well or not, whether change needs to happen. It just says, this is what I find important. So say for a CFO, uh, profitability is an important driver for the organization. It doesn't say if profit is high or low or should be, should be improved or whatever. It just says profitability is important. Then we have the assessment concept with this little looking glass as its symbol. And that says looking at the enterprise from the perspective of a driver, how are we doing? So is profit good or bad? Uh, are we say, compliant with regulation or not? That's the assessment. And then based on an assessment, you can start formulating your goals. Well, if everything's fine, of course, you don't need to change anything, but that's rather uh, seldom the case. That's why we architects are always very busy. There are lots of goals that we need to achieve that give you direction. Where do we need to go? What do we want to have? And of course, you can do that at all kinds of uh, levels of detail. You can your, have your high-level strategic goals and then drill down into more detailed goals. Now, next to goals, you might also want to model the actual outcomes you get or expect to get. Or maybe you want to prevent some outcomes from happening. That's why we have the outcome concept. And if you look at the symbol, it shows this dart stuck in the bullseye. That's, of course, what you'd like to have, an outcome that really is in line with the goals you've set yourself. But that's not always the case. So it is important that you can also model the outcomes uh, and see the difference between your goals, uh, with your goals. And finally, and we will see that later on when I introduce uh, the one new concept in Archimate 3.1, the concept of value, the value produced by the enterprise for different stakeholders. Um, and that can be monetary value, can just be about money, but it can be about all kinds of things. It can be about, um, say, uh, efficiency, or it can be about uh, usability, or all sorts of things that different stakeholders might find important, the value you produce. Now, next to these motivation elements, we have the strategy elements if the thing wants to zap. Yeah, there we are. And here we have this one new concept, and I'll get to that. First of all, we have the concept course of action. That gives you the strategic direction and the plan of the enterprise. Where do you want to go? What are you going to do to achieve your goals? So basically, how am I going to use my, my capabilities and resources to get to where I want to be? Then we have the concept of capability. That's probably the most popular addition we did in Archimate 3.0. Um, capability maps. Who, who in, the, in the room is using capability maps? Yeah, that's quite, quite a large number. Um, I just recently did some statistics, actually yesterday did some statistics on a number of large clients of ours, just counting which concepts they use the most. Well, of course, application component was number one, business process was number two, but capability was in the top ten. It is a very popular concept. Um, capability maps can be useful for all kinds of uh, reasons, and I'll show more of that later. Now we have the concept of a resource. Next to your capabilities, which represents what you're able to do, you can say the resources are the assets you have. Um, just looking at capabilities is not enough. Unfortunately, some of the business architecture methods out there, somebody, some, some of you might know the BizBoc, don't really recognize this as a perspective, just focus on capabilities. But take, for example, well, say, say um, you're in a mining company, and you have excellent mining capabilities, but you don't have a mine. Problem, right? So resources are quite important. And then there is this one new addition in Archimate 3.1 called Value Stream. 
And a value stream represents the, the sequence of activities that an organization does at a high level of abstraction to produce value. What are the steps, the stages in the value production of the enterprise? Where capabilities are kind of the organization at rest, the value streams model the organization in motion. And of course, for the different stages in your value stream, you will need different capabilities, and we will see that later. Uh, and value streams are not to be confused with business processes because they are not about the individual tasks that you execute to produce a specific product. This is about the higher level overall value creation, but they will be realized by business processes. Tomorrow in the Archimate user group, I will discuss this in more detail uh, and also the other changes in the Archimate 3.1 release. Today, this is the one new thing that I will, uh, that I will show. Then I mentioned the implementation and migration elements. And specifically, out of that set of elements, I think two are most important. Work package, as a concept for representing the work you do to change something. That could be, say, a project or program, or uh, the work of agile teams, or whatever you do uh, to create something new. And plateaus that help you model things like roadmaps, the um, stable stages of your architecture, the stages in which it evolves um, for planning purposes. So those two concepts out of the implementation migration elements, those are the ones that are most relevant for business architecture in my perspective. We have a few more, but these are the, the things that I typically use and I see others use as well. Um, so if, you, if we add up these concepts, that gives you this line of sight from your high level goals and outcomes <coughs> via the courses of action you've planned to change the world uh, through your capabilities, resources, the, the core of the architecture and the change initiatives. Um, that is this line of sight from strategy to realization. That helps organizations really focus on what's important. Now, one um, caveat in using Archimate, of course, if you have seen Archimate as a language, it's, um, well, it's similar to what we see in, in other languages like UML or BPMN. It looks um, similar in, in, in boxes and lines. That might not be the best way to show business architecture to non-architects. Um, in practice, I, I encounter basically three types of uh, people in management, and it has more to do with their personal background than with their uh, formal position. Um, but let's say the first type is people with a, a technical background. Could be in, in, uh, in software, could also be something else. Um, they are pretty adept at reading uh, these kinds of diagrams. I once was uh, in, a, in a discussion with somebody at Philips, Philips Electronics in the Netherlands, about how they communicated with, uh, with their management. And he said, well, we just show them uh, UML diagrams. Uh, and I said, hmm, management doesn't really understand that. But my experience is more in government and in finance, and they wouldn't uh, want to look at UML diagrams at all. But he said, yes, that's not a problem. All our management are electronics uh, engineers, and they are used to very complicated diagrams. We can easily teach them that. OK, so that works for them. So that's one group. The second group I see are people with um, a financial background. You find lots of them in management. And they often like to see tables, charts, matrices, cross-references. That's the kind of information you can easily generate out of a model. It might not be the way the model itself looks when you, you put it in Archimate, but the information is there. Um, so that's a different representation with, uh, well, with something that looks like what you get out of Excel, typically. The third group I find the most difficult and that's people with a legal background, also prevalent in, uh, in management. Steve, you've got a legal background, right? What do you think of Archimate? <laughs> <laughs> well, people with a legal background are really focused on text. And there's even some scientific research into that. If you, if you sh show some, say, uh, article with text and images to a, a person with a technical background, they look really closely at the images, looking at the individual arrows and asking themselves if they shouldn't be the other way around. And literally, in about half of the presentation, uh, presentations I do on Archimate, there is somebody in the room asking me, what does that arrow mean? And the second question is, shouldn't, be, shouldn't it be the other way around? And they just skim through the text diagonally. People with a legal background are, ex are the exact opposite. They read the text very, very closely, down to the individual comma, because that might have legal significance. And they just uh, skip through the picture, pictures. So that's a very diff difficult group to address with architecture, architecture in general, Archimate models in particular, 
Um, I haven't found an easy solution. We once tried an experiment to generate text out of models, just verbalizing the model, and it can be done, but that is really, really boring prose. That's worse than legalese. So I don't have a, an easy solution. But you have to adapt to your audience. You have to find a way to represent that. So I will use some alternative notations here and there in, in, in the examples I give, just to give you an idea of what's, what could be done. Um, now, let's start with an example that some of you might know. Um, yeah. Arc Assurance. The example case we've used uh, over the years, uh, ever since the start of the Archimed project, actually, um, a fictitious but pretty realistic insurance company, the result of a number of mergers. Well, some of you might have even been in those kinds of companies. Um, insurance companies are in, in difficult circumstances. The interest rate is, is crazy low, so that it's very difficult for them to fulfill their long-term obligations, especially life insurance, really problematic nowadays. And of course, you have this whole digital disruption, uh, all kinds of new entrants, uh, fintechs, and all sorts of other companies entering their market. So our example company, Arc Assurance, needs to do two things. Become more efficient in its current operations to lower its costs, and they need a new business model to counter these, these digital competitors. And in my example, I will focus mostly on the second part. The first part, um, reducing your application landscape, for example. Uh, I've got examples of that as well, but not in this, in this slide deck. But you can, you can see what you can do there uh, easily. So we need a new business model. We'll see that in the storyline. But let's, let's start with the ecosystem of Arc Assurance. Um, and I've, uh, it's a somewhat simplified picture, but what you see here is the insurance company itself. Uh, its customers at the bottom, and the insurance intermediaries. Uh, it sells its insurances also through intermediaries. And this doesn't look like an Archimed picture, but actually, behind this are Archimed concepts. It's just visualized in different ways. Uh, and you can do different kinds of mappings if you want to, but this is to show an ecosystem to some non-technical experts to show how these different flows between these, these parties uh, can be described, who is sending what to whom, so we've got these product offerings and we've got the product itself and there's money flowing, etc. cetera. Uh, just an alternative representation. I don't know, I think we need a new clicker. Ah, oh, there, there we go. Capability maps, I mentioned them already and I will show more of them, several of them later. Um, Structured overviews of the capabilities of your organization. And very useful to project all kinds of information on top of, because people start to recognize this after a while. Typically, a capability map is in the terms of the business, owned by the business, designed by the business, with the help of the business architects, but it's really a business thing. And because it's this common background, you can project all kinds of information on top of it, uh, and that's, um, yeah, that's starting to become the standard way of looking at your enterprise for many uh, organizations. So, say your strategic importance of certain capabilities for your goals, uh, all sorts of uh, KPIs you can put on there, the resources you need for them, uh, the evolution of the capabilities, uh, which project impact there is on capabilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now, Arc Assurance, of course, has a capability map. If I can, yeah, there we are. Um, oh, that's. Um, and this is inspired by um, an existing reference model for the uh, insurance industry, simplified a bit for demonstration purposes, but you get the idea. You see the core of the organization, the operational capabilities in the middle, strategic capabilities at the top that give direction and supporting capabilities at the bottom. Um, by the way, does anyone want to guess what the one capability is that I've removed from the strategic layer here? Which capability was there, but I've removed it because it gave me too much discussion? Come on. Enterprise architecture, of course. But there were people when I presented that at, at, at uh, some companies, they say, oh no, enterprise architecture is just part of our IT department, should be a, a sub-capability of IT management. I disagree, it should be up there. But I didn't want to go into that discussion, so I just removed it. But capability map. Now, like I said, you can project all kinds of information on there, and the typical way of doing that is using heat maps, and this is one example, a heat map of efficiency of these capabilities, but you can do this for all kinds of purposes, and I have a few more uh, to show later. Um, so, that's Arc Assurance and what it does today, the capabilities it has today. 
Now, perhaps uh, for this new uh, uh, business model, they will need something else, but we will see that. They've made this strategic analysis, starting with this, the, the board of the company as stakeholders, they look into the profitability, and they see that there are some issues there. Um, first of all, they see that customers defect to competitors that have a better digital experience. And on the other hand, they, uh, some other customers defect to competitors that are cheaper. So they need to counter these two effects. Um, and the basic goal they have is increase in revenue. They want to, to improve their, their, their income. This is not about the efficiency part, so lowering costs could be another way of improving profitability, but that was this, uh, the second bit. I don't want to go there uh, now. This is really about uh, new business. And then they see they need to have two sub-goals. One is the uh, customer retention that needs to be improved, and the other is they need to increase their market share by uh, having a, an attractive, uh, financially attractive offer to their customers. That lower layer we'll see in uh, one of the next pictures again. But they've done more. They've created a SWOT analysis. And this is, again, not an Archimate picture, but actually all these things are, again, Archimate elements. Um, what you see in the, uh, in the strengths and weaknesses, et cetera, those are assessments. And the bit in the middle, um, that's in, uh, in course of action uh, concepts, like that. So here we see how, for example, a strength of the company like broad product coverage and an opportunity, these affluent millennials that they want to uh, sell their insurances to, could be exploited using this, uh, this strategy of digital customer intimacy. And what that is, I'll show you uh, in a minute. But this is a way of depicting an argument model. Again, not in argument concepts, but something that the business could easily understand. It's not complicated uh, uh, technical notation. So, this strategy, what, 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 what does it entail? Well, first of all, they want to engage more closely with customers via social media to improve the customer experience. Um, and on the other hand, they want to harvest more data on customers so that they can pr improve their premium uh, setting. So, for example, in the Netherlands, we have some car insurance companies that put a black box in your car in this OBD port under your dashboard that monitor, monitors your driving behavior. And if you don't take corners too quickly, uh, don't accelerate too, too quickly, they, they give you a discount. That's, that's the idea there. But they will need new capabilities and resources for this. Um, their current uh, capabilities are not good enough for that. They don't have this uh, social media capability. They don't have the, uh, the, the data part. So that's where we get back to our strategic analysis. Uh, but first, we, we did a bit of stakeholder analysis, and this is on, on the goal of improving customer satisfaction by uh, the social media part. Again, a picture that is not in Archimate notation, but actually these things are stakeholders with influence relationships that say something about how they can influence each other. And this is the typical uh, TOGAF power grid. You know, uh, if you know TOGAF, you know about this, the interest versus the power of these stakeholders. So again, you can express it in Archimate without showing an Archimate diagram. But back to our strategic analysis, this was the bottom part of the, the previous one. Uh, we can then define some uh, specific goals uh, based on what we want to achieve, and then we can define the outcomes we're planning for, like this best-in-class online customer experience and these detailed insights in customer behavior. And together, those are the outcomes from our digital customer intimacy strategy. Now, we do need a few new capabilities for that, uh, because this is uh, not something you can easily uh, implement without having the right digital customer management capability, part of our overall customer management, uh, and this data-driven insurance capability, part of our uh, overall uh, in insurance capabilities. We'll, we'll see more about that. Two new capabilities we need. Right. Then, another picture that doesn't look like Archimate, but represents the business model of the company. Um, again, Archimate concepts, uh, a business model canvas, probably something uh, many of you will be familiar with. I don't want to go into the details of what's expressed here, but it's about the value proposition, uh, the key activities and resources mapped to Archimate concepts again. So we see capabilities, for example, for these key activities. We see the value concept in the middle. Um, so that's the business model they envisage. For these millennials, uh, we see the, the customer segments uh, over there. Uh, we see what they want to offer. Now we get to how we create that value, this, this value proposition in the middle. And here is this one new concept in Archimate 3.1, the value stream concept. And this is the high-level overall value stream of the company, developing products, 
marketing and selling them, managing policies and claims, and then serving their customers. That's how they create value. That value itself can be modeled with Archimate's existing value concept. We already have that. I've also modeled the outcome of the overall value stream and the, the stakeholder it is for. This is the customer. You could link these different value elements also to that stakeholder. I didn't want to make the picture too cluttered, but of course that's value for that stakeholder in many cases. Sometimes you have internal value you produce there. Could also be relevant. Um, now this, this, this value stream is supported by the capabilities of the organization. Um, so below this we need the different capabilities from that capability map I showed you before. So this shows how these things intersect. Um, and way down at the bottom, we see this data-driven insurance and digital customer management. Those are the two new capabilities that I introduced uh, previously that we need to add. This is a different representation of that. A business outcome journey map, terminology invented by Gartner. Uh, they have these uh, uh, usually four-word uh, terms nowadays, um, a business outcome-driven enterprise architecture, that's even five. Um, this is a different representation of, of that same picture before, um, but still capturing the same, the same data, the same information. Now drilling down from these capabilities, we can go to uh, our, cap our, our resources below these, and here we have a, a refinement of the initial capabilities. So we need data analysis and data acquisition as part of this data-driven insurance, for example. And then we need specific resources for that, uh, like data analysis competency and data analysis automation. Um, I was really giving up. Yeah, right. You, we can use these, these resources also to express kind of high level uh, what the solution is about. Um, well, you can, you can read that. Uh, so the data analysis automation, for example, that captures data on customers from these data sources and goes, that goes into the integrated back office automation that I didn't show here, but that's part of this second part of the strategy, improving their application landscape, for example. We see the outcomes we plan for this and uh, some other uh, areas, some, some requirements. Um, but I want to focus mostly on the, uh, the business part of this. Um, so we need the realization of these resources in our core architecture, and we can realize our value streams by business processes. So we can drill down from this high level into the details of the architecture by adding these, uh, these kinds of, uh, of concepts. Uh, so you can really trace from high level strategy to the details. Uh, similarly for capabilities, they will be realized by the business functions of the enterprise, which are in, in turn uh, performed by the different departments of the organization. So here we see the assignment of that. You also see that it's often not a one-to-one -one mapping between capabilities, functions, and departments, uh, because a capability might stretch across multiple uh, parts of that. And then finally, we can plan and realize those changes using these concepts from the implementation migration layer. This is a high-level plan when to, to achieve these capabilities. Uh, of course, you can, you can drill down into the details there if you want to, modeling the exact changes, but for this presentation, that was a bit too much. So that gives this, this full line of sight. This, this shows how these things uh, would fit together. Um, now let me show you some real life cases. Um, one is the capability management at a, at a major bank. Uh, and we use the BIAN standard for this, which is now in this latest incarnation expressed in Archimate as well. That was a collaboration between the Open Group and the BIAN consortium. Uh, if you go to that link, you'll see the, the full Archimate model. But let me just show you a bit of that. This is the full high level picture. Uh, you can't read any of that, right? Uh, so <laughs> so let's, let's zoom in a bit. Uh, here we see the, the uh, left -hand, uh, upper left-hand corner of that. We see what they call their, their, their service uh, uh, landscape. Uh, and we see a number of areas, and then we see some capabilities in there. And they've, they've even used the stereotype uh, notation in Archimate to express that they have business domains and service domains as a well, kind of capability. Um, this customer for which we, we did this implementation drilled down from these capabilities into their implementation, and it's, this uh, beyond standard really goes very deep into the, the communication between applications even, so uh, that was also part of this whole story. Um, so you can go well, quite, quite deep into that. But my main uh, point here is the, the business architecture bit. So standards for capability maps from, from some uh, industry consortium are quite useful. This is another one. Uh, it's also about data, data, uh, data driven data as a service from uh, a government agency, uh, a high level capability map again, 
what do you need to have if you want to do data analytics? Um, and also a value stream for producing insights from that data and the relevant capabilities that support that. Another example uh, is from a pharmaceutical. Again, a somewhat simplified for demonstration purposes and anonymized, of course. Um, let's zoom in again. Here we see what they want. Uh, they want to be the, uh, the leading provider of pharmaceutical services in the world, uh, world domination. Um, then they have operational excellence and product leadership as goals, and then we drill down from there into the more concrete change goals, requirements, capabilities, plateaus, and work packages again. This is their capability map. Um, so I know I, I started from, from the other end. Uh, again, simplified a bit for, uh, for this presentation. And they also use that to map, in this case, strategic goals to it. So we see that uh, operational excellence and product leadership map to different capabilities, different impact on these different capabilities. Um, they also map that to a value stream, and they, they even uh, mapped different um, metrics to that. Uh, and here we see two things visualized on the one hand, the cost of the application uh, landscape, the, uh, the IT cost, aggregated to these capabilities and eventually to the steps in the value stream. And also the end of life IT risk, also aggregated and shown with colors. So we see, for example, that this uh, sales value stream stage is at risk because there's this customer billing and collection management that apparently has some old IT somewhere down there, maybe some server uh, or some, some system running Windows XP or whatever. Uh, and you can see the business impact of that at this level without showing all the technical details. So that's also an example of how to use uh, your business visualizations to show the relationship to everything that's, that's down there. Now, coming to some conclusions. Archimate is really intended to bridge this gap from high-level strategic direction to implementation. Uh, as, you, as you've seen, um, this line of sight uh, can, can easily be modeled using Archimate concepts, maybe represented in different ways, and uh, that really helps you make these analyses. It gives you that full traceability. Without that, a business architect uh, sort of, sort of uh, hangs, hangs in, uh, in between these different worlds. If you can't link to the enterprise architecture, details, and you can't link upstream to the strategy, as a business architect, you're, uh, as a business architect, you're kind of lost in the middle. So that's quite important. What's also relevant is you do need to show this in different ways to different stakeholders. And given the, the, the huge world of stakeholders out there, this is not something any standard can predefine for you. So you might want to be creative or might want to ask your tool vendor to support you with that. But appropriate visualizations are important. With your colleagues, with other architects, you can easily use the Archimate language. With others, you might need something different. Um, but finally, I would say add Archimate to your business architect's toolbox. I think it's a, a great tool for that. It covers um, the whole space of business architecture. All these concepts are in there. So um, I think it's a, a really great help. Um, finally, I have some links for you. Yes, there we are. If you want to know more about the Archimate language itself, of course, go to the website of the Open Group, the Archimate Forum. Uh, is over there. All the, the new stuff can be downloaded from there. I, by the way, I didn't download the new version of the standard yet. I guess it's on there, uh, Andrew? It is, there, yeah. it is. Okay, right. So you can, you can get it uh, right there. There's an Archimate LinkedIn group. Interesting discussions. Over 11,000 members nowadays. Grows with about 1,000 a year. Uh, and a, a quick reference with uh, the Archimate 3.1 concepts shown in action in, in small pictures showing some context. So it's not uh, a simple list of all the definitions. You can get that from the standard. Uh, but it shows them in, uh, in a little bit of, uh, of context. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Please have a seat. We have some questions for you. I had one that I've never really thought about, but how did it come to be called Archimate? Ah, <laughs> well, there are two stories about that. <laughs> uh, it's sort of at the same time when we started with that project, one is that um, there were some ideas about animating architecture, creating something that was dynamic. So architecture, animation, that's one. Right. And the other one is that uh, it was kind of the work made for the architect, uh, like this workbench. Uh, right. So th those ideas came, came up at the same time, uh, so we called it Archimate. Makes sense, makes sense. Okay. Um,
first question, you showed the Panorama 360 reference model. Are there other reference models for other industries that are out there? Yeah, well, uh, the, the BN model was an example uh, that yeah. I, that, that, yeah. that, 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 but there are others. Um, some of them are expressed by the standardization organizations themselves, sometimes using Archimed, but that's, we should promote that. Uh, mm -hmm. For others, it's often a question of just converting it to that. Um, one example where that is fairly easy is all these APQC models for processes uh, that works. Uh, that we, we've done that ourselves. And another uh, quite relevant example, which is not may maybe a reference model, but NATO has in its newest NATO architecture framework that came out early last year, uh, has now approved Archimed as one of the two approved meta models for expressing defense architecture. Nice segue to the next question, oh. meta models. <laughs> Are the meta model and the meta meta model of what you showed based on industry standards or are they Invented by your team. <laughs> it is an industry standard, right? Archimate. So <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, actually, the meta meta level. Uh, so the the way we express the meta model um, is is based on a stripped down, simplified version of the MOF meta model. So we don't use the full MOF meta model. You might, if you're into the meta model world, you might know about that. But we created a very very simple stripped down version. Like Archimate is much simpler than than UML is. Um, so it's inspired, I would say, by an industry standard meta model. Right. Meta meta model. You're finding, you're guessing what the questions are before you even, so you gave a nice segue to the next question. <laughs> you mentioned UML and other languages. What makes Archimate different or better than those? Um, I didn't put that picture in, but Archimate has a broader coverage, but less detail. It doesn't force you into the details like UML does because it's more implementation oriented. Mm -hmm. Uh, or BPMN with all its different kinds of events and gateways, et cetera. Uh, but Archimate connects these worlds, so you can, you can create a single model that can be um, detailed out in these different languages. So you have a kind of higher level model covering the broader picture on top, and from there you can drill down into the detailed models. Right, okay, thank you. Um, would you link value streams to anything else? Like? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, is, there, is there a thought for whoever uh, submitted that um, as to what was behind it? Wishing to remain anonymous. Yes, all right, well, we'll whoever that was can maybe grab you uh, yeah. afterwards and, uh, and explain that one. Um, I'm learning how to use Archimate and have heard people mention the exchange file format. What is it and how can it help me? Yeah, it's a standardized way of exchanging argument models between tools. So uh, if you have a certified tool, it should support that format so you can easily move your model to another tool. Right. Okay, thank you. And uh, that's the end of the questions, Mark. Um, uh, you mentioned the Archimate user group tomorrow. Do you want to give another plug for that? Uh, yeah, uh, come to the Archimate user group. You'll get more <laughs> details about uh, the changes in uh, Archimate 3.1 uh, and some other interesting presentations. Um, it's, uh, it's tomorrow afternoon, the whole afternoon. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very interesting program. Okay, well, thank you, Mark.